Hello, hi. This is Dr. Joy Kong. Um, so I, um, I'm the president and uh, founder of um, American Academy of Integrative Cell Therapy. I've been doing regenerative medicine for some time. I've been focusing on anti-aging therapy and of course using stem cells as a powerful tool uh, for anti-aging treatments. And, and to me, anti-aging, the meaning of anti-aging is to prevent decline. And so by preventing decline that we're really preventing disease. So that's probably the most powerful way to enhance health. Anyhow, so I, um, I, in my practice, I treat people with serious medical conditions, but I also um, help people who are already in great health, but they just want to use stem cell therapy as a tool to maintain their youth and vitality. Um, so, so those are the two types of population, but anyone can benefit from an anti-aging uh, therapy, right? We all want to maintain youth. We all want to function at the highest level possible. So to me, that's what anti-aging is about. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, stem cells as the tool, a powerful tool for anti-aging uh, treatments. So... What I'm gonna talk about, you know, of course we all know we all want to function optimally. And, and how do we achieve that? And what is, the, what is the cause of, you know, not being able to be at our best? And I think the root cause is the aging process. The aging process includes um, various causes, you know, has various causes, um, and um, but that is eventually what's not allowing our body to repair itself and regenerate. And so, one example is something as simple as osteoarthritis. Uh, people think, oh, that's a disease for, from aging. That um, when we when we age, there's you know, and that they think it's wear and tear disease. Um, that when you get older, of course, you worn on your body so much. But that's really, really kind of a naive way of looking at this. What's happening with osteoarthritis is that it's not a wear and tear disease. It's a systemic inflammatory condition because when we were little kids, we wear and tear our body way more than how much we're tearing ourselves uh, at 50 or 60 years of age, but our body can respond right away and get it, everything repaired. Um, so, so one example is when you put an implanted, when you implant a knee construct, right? Because you think it's wear and tear, then let's replace, let's put a new knee construct in the osteoarthritic knee. Guess what? They get destroyed because it's an environment that the inflammatory environment that's degrading the new knee construct. So it's not so much the wear and tear. So it's really the regenerative capacity that's not keeping up with what's necessary for repair. And, you know, like I said, when we're little kids, you know, we are running all over the place. We're doing all kinds of things that, uh, you know, make our parents worry, but we get repaired right away and very completely. But what happens when we're older? You know, we're barely using our body very much and we're stiff, we can't get things repaired quickly, and then we suffer from long-term, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, lack of flexibility, lack of strength, and, and chronic pain. So really it's a, it's a supply and demand issue of how much are you able to be able to supply what's necessary for repair, and then what's causing aging, right? So if aging, is one of the causes that we can achieve our optimal health. Um, there are a lot of different uh, hypotheses on what causes aging, and they all play a factor. So starting with mitochondria dysfunction that we all talk about a lot about, and gene genomic instability, so genetic changes as we age, you know, from, um, you know, the, the, the oxidative damages or from toxins that we bring into our body and there are epigenetic changes which are brought on by you know what we do with our lives and and how that affect 
affect our genes and how our genes actually turn on or off. And then the telomere attrition, so we all know that as our cells divide, then we lose more and more of the, the length of the telomere and eventually the telomere length is not gonna be enough to allow um, safe and accurate uh, duplication of our DNA. And then also there's defective protein repair. Um, so the, the, you know, if we don't have the correct protein, we can repair them. Of course, various functions in our body are so dependent on the proteins uh, in our body, then that our ability to repair will lag. And then also cells do go through a process of aging. So that's the cellular senescence. And what do all these cause? All these lead to eventually leads to impaired cell to cell functioning. And the bottom line is that if you can't have enough stem cells to replace the damaged tissue, then, then you're not gonna be able to fix whatever the problem is, right? So everything still leads to, the bottom line is if you can have all the damage you want, but if your stem cells are good, you can replace them, then, then your body will, will have a new start, right? But as we age, um, our stem cell also start to get exhausted and partially from all these factors. And so the way I look at aging is um, it, it's like a house that's catching fire, right? So by the time smoke comes out, that's what I say, okay, we, we've got symptoms. So that's when we can diagnose a person with particular condition. But what happens before the smoke comes out? You got fire was still going on, right? The smoke just doesn't all of a sudden come out uh, in a split second. The fire has been smoldering in a house, so in our body. Things are brewing. We just can't see it. The person looks okay because you're not noticing symptoms. It takes a lot of these fires to be catching on, collecting their momentum until more things are burned up and then you see the smoke. So the aging process is like the smoldering fire um, and disease is when the smoke actually comes out. And this is why we have the uh, phrase of inflammaging. So inflammation and aging are so tightly connected that the, now we think of them as kind of a one entity. And so what happens when we age? Um, we can check a person's inf inflammation by looking at their inflammatory markers. What's interesting is that even a person looks really healthy, right? Like this gentleman, you know, vibrant, you know, boxing, looking great, but his inflammatory markers are elevated, such as LA6 and TNF-alpha. Um, so, the person has no ostensibly no health issues, no infection, but these are elevated. But in young people, you don't see such things because these, you know, healthy young, young person, these cytokines are very tightly regulated. Um, so infl inflammation is actually the main driver of tissue damage associated with almost all age related diseases. So a lot of diseases come on more when we age, um, including cancer and, and different, you know, uh, you know, autoimmune issues or neurodegenerative issues. And inf inflammatory response are pretty much associated with all of them. And these inflammation, the elevation of the inflammation markers actually can predict disease and disability uh, in the aging population. And there's also... Um, evidence showing that, that increased inflammatory markers are strongly linked to poor physical performance, decreased muscle strength, uh, cognitive decline, and also early death. So um, stem cells has been shown to be a tool, uh, an anti-aging tool by targeting inflammation. For example, in a rat uh, traumatic brain model, the intravenous infusion of MSC, so mesenchymal stem cells, actually can decrease brain uh, inflammatory cell infiltration, the microglial aggregation, and apoptotic cell numbers, so reducing the damage, re re reducing cell death. And in another study, they looked at 172 patients uh, with RA and 16 with lupus, and they um, transplanted allogeneic, which means from an another person. So allogenic 
MSCs actually helped reestablish the immune balance, shifting the immune system from a pro-inflammatory to an anti-inflammatory state. And there's significant uh, decrease in IL-6, TNF-alpha, and CRP levels. Uh, and then another study, patients with ankylosing spondylitis with high disease activity, when they infused these um, allergenic, you know, from another person, MSCs, that also decreased the inflammatory marker and decreased the disease activity. And they also have shown benefits in Crohn's disease that the MSCs not only have improved these people's quality of life, but the CRP levels was also improved. And so the thought is if we can slow our, de our decline and slow the aging process, maybe we can repair faster and better, and then we can slow the aging process, right? Um, so stem cells is a very, very hopeful way of achieving this. And I'm going to show you some of the, um, the, the stats. So, you know, we all know that we all came from a single stem cell. So the fer fertilized egg, that's the, you know, where the miracle starts. And that eventually make an incredible human being like us, you know, thinking, talking, accomplishing things and enjoying life. So what can we do to harness the kind of intelligence that actually allows the formation of life? If we can tap into that kind of intelligence, that would be remarkable, right? So we all, we all knew stem cells is incredibly powerful, but does it actually work in real clinical practice? So that was the question. And when, when I first got into the field, you know, of course I heard about how great stem cells can be and they sound, you know, amazing, but does it really work? And it's only when I started seeing um, patients getting incredible results, not just my own patients, but, you know, patients treated by other doctors, uh, the kind of results are pretty irrefutable and, and incredibly inspiring. So um, one thing that we have to accept is that as we age, we're losing our stem cells um, to a very, in a very rapid pace. So that's, that's just a fact of life that we have to accept. So when we were first born, this is a ratio of the number of mesenchymal stem cells in your body versus the number of total cells, total number of cells. So, so when we're born, every one in 10,000 cells in our body is a stem cell, is an MSC. So MSC is really considered master regeneration and they're all over our body, everywhere where your tissue is vascularized, MSCs are there. Um, so one in 10,000 when we're first born. And then when we grow to teenage years, it has lowered to one in a hundred thousand. So that's tenfold decrease as far as the ratio. And then when we reach our forties, uh, it becomes one in 400,000. And when we reach our eighties is one in 2 million. So you can see, uh, this is the, the graph of that drastic decline. It's like we're running out of these stem cells, out of these powerful cells that can help our body to regenerate. And I talked about MSC. So before they get into the blood vessels, um, they're called parasites. So they're peri, so they're, you know, right wrapping around blood vessels. So in every tissue where you have blood vessels um, that's supplying the nutrients and taking away the waste, these cells are there. So what they do is that not only they're you can you can look at all those, you know, tentacles, right? All these uh uh you, you know, these extensions of the cell where they actually are not only trying to sense what's going on in the blood, they're trying to sense the signals, but they're also communicating with the neighboring cells. So they kind of have, have their pulse on the whole neighborhood and the, and the environment and monitoring what's going on, what's flowing through your blood. So you're systemically what the signals are, they, they can also detect. And these are, you know, what they look like under a microscope. And they have been proposed to be renamed medicinal signaling cells by the doctor, Dr. Kaplan, Arnold Kaplan, who discovered these cells. And, and so now he wants to rename these cells um, as medicinal signaling cells because he thinks it's a kind of a misnomer to call them stem cells because their main function is to produce signals. And these signals will promote 
regeneration. Um, so the MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells or medicinal signaling cells have a lot of different properties. So I want to go through them really quickly. And, 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 you know, a lot of the audience I'm sure already know, but it's really pretty exciting. You know, maybe a couple of them you don't know. For example, the anti-inflammatory effects. So they secrete a lot of anti-inflammatory uh, molecules that can calm inflammation. Of course, you know, when you're acutely inflamed, you really can't quite regenerate and repair, even though the acute inflammation is an important process in, in healing. And then the immune modulatory effect, that's what we saw in the immune modulation where you can uh, shift the immune system from a pro-inflammatory to an anti-inflammatory state. And the regenerative potential, um, you know, that's mostly uh, through the um, paraquine effect, which just means secreting signals in the neighbor, in the small neighborhood, um, instead of, you know, endocrine, which is secreting your signals into the bloodstream affecting the whole body. So the paracrine effect, um, you know, includes sending out all these growth factors to the neighborhood, you know, other um, cytokines. And um, they also communicate directly with local stem cells. So the kind of regenerative um, uh, uh, actions they, they, they trigger a lot of times is by talking with the local stem cells, not by themselves becoming a new cell. Let's say, you know, a cell is, 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 is put in, the, uh, in a muscle, right? Mu mu uh, the muscle cells may regenerate, but, but guess what it came from? It came from the local stem cells that actually are destined to, to differentiate into muscle cells, not so much of these MSCs that's injected. You know, very, very tiny amount of them may differentiate, but there's been decades of research. Now we realize that even though we were hoping that these cells will differentiate into everything. But what we found out is that the the vast majority of this is effect, maybe over 95% of how it works is through these, um, these, uh, these paracrine effect, these you know, uh, f uh, by sending out signals to the neighboring cells and allowing the local stem cells to actually do the real cell differentiation and replacing the, the, the damaged cells. Um, and mitochondria transfer and oh, angiogenic potentials. It's, it's, it's really important, right? Without blood supply, then the tissue is not gonna survive. And so in, in various tissues, um, they found these incredible angiogenic uh, potential from these stem cells. And mitochondria transfer is another very interesting mechanism where um, these um, implanted cells, especially if you uh, implant young, healthy cells, they will have young, healthy mitochondria. So these mitochondria has been shown under electron microscopy to be transferred into the recipient cells. So actually revitalizing uh, and energizing the the, the cells in the in the recipient, right? And then antifibrotic properties has been shown over and over again for you know various you know um, you know either local fibrosis even in like Peyronie's disease uh, has been shown in lung fibrosis, liver cirrhosis. So it's um it's very powerful in breaking down scar tissue, and anti apoptotic. Um, so. When when cells are, let's say you have stroke and there's an area of decreased blood flow and some cells will die because they are starved of nutrients, but the neighboring cells will end up receiving these signals from the dying cells and they may go on these apoptosis, right? We know that the, the infarct size is often a lot larger than where the blood supply is lost. So that's the apoptotic process. And what stem cells can do is rescue these cells that are, you know, otherwise are gonna go on a program cell death, either because of chemical or, or you know, or, or vascular, you know, injuries and radiation injuries, so can actually rescue them. And the reverse, the pro-apoptotic is also very important because we have seen these cells, when they look at, when they, get in contact, especially younger cells, when they get in contact with precancerous or cancer cells, they will have these surface uh, markers or, or you know, characteristics that these cells can recognize that these are pathological cells. 
and then they can send in particular factors, including what's called like a trail, what's called trail ligand. So that actually can get into these cancer cells and trigger apoptosis. So make them die. Um, so that's an incredibly powerful tool uh, uh, as well. And then um, antimicrobial, we, you know, we know that these MSCs actually secrete antimicrobial peptides. So they've been shown to be beneficial to fight, you know, bacterial, viral, uh, fungal, and, you know, protozoan um, uh, infections. And I want to talk just a little bit about young versus old MSCs. So what do I mean by old? Of course, the older you are, the older the MSCs are. But, you know, even a person's 20 years old, I still think that's an old MSC if I, I'm getting cells from this 20-year-old. That's still way older than something from a, from the umbilical cord or placenta, right, of a newborn. So day zero versus day, not day, year 20, uh, that's, there's a huge difference. Or even when a child is six, seven years old, their cells would not nearly be as powerful as what's in the birth tissue. Um, so I want to show you, um, you know, talk about whether or not age matters, because this is an important thing, because, the, it's, you know, initially, stem cell therapy was was done, the first stem cell therapy was bone marrow transplant. So bone marrow were the earliest source of stem cells. And then later on, we realized, oh, there are stem cells in the other tissues too, not just the bone marrow, because some, you know, a few decades ago, we still thought that only bone marrow has stem cells. So there's, there's an evolution of where we think we can find these stem cells. And then later on, they found stem cells in fat, and then they realize it's everywhere. <laughs> so, um, but when these stem cells are basically staying with you your entire life, right? You're born with a lot of stem cells. So what happens when you carry these stem cells with you everywhere? You know, every job you've had, every party you've had, every country you've traveled to, um, you know, every bad food you put in your body, they're there with you. So there's a lifelong accumulation of of things that can damage you. And these damages will, will actually make the cells, you know, more prone to, to cell death. You know, they, they, they will lead to cell senescence. And there's also, these damages can result in loss of regenerative functions and even uh, neoplastic transformations. So the cancer's changes. So that is, you know, you know, that that's what we need to keep in mind. Just because we have stem cells, they are our cells. They've been with us all this time. Um, but when you compare with neonatal MSCs, so that includes, you know, cells from the umbilical cord, you know, umbilical cord tissue, cord blood, uh, placenta, there are very, very few cells in amniotic, uh, amniotic fluid, extremely few cells, but, but all these are neonatal. And these are spared of the pro-aging factors that, um, that, that we have in, in the stem cells in our body. And I, I wanna show you some evidence that age does matter. So this is not just you know, my opinion, right? These are from people who have devoted many, many years to, to understand the differences. So uh, one study that looked at um, adipose-derived MSC. So this is from a, you know adult person, which you know means that this is an aged MSC. So what they they found out was that they are significantly compromised in their ability to support um, forming a new vascular network. So then and then when when there's wound um, in the you know in the skin, that these cells were not able to rescue. Um, you know, these, um, the healing, basically, they're, they're not able to rescue age related, related impairment in the healing. So because they're old themselves, so they can't make the healing any better. And then in another study, study in 2014, they looked at bone marrow derived MSCs, and they have less myogenic potential, and less engraftment properties when they're compared with develop, developmentally early MSCs. And then in another study, they look, looked at bone, bone marrow derived stem cells and they exhibit age related decline in inflammatory response, in cytokine, chemokine, you know, receptor expression that are important 
for the migration of these MICs and their activation, as well as their immune modulatory activities. That's so important for their function. So, so they do decline over time. And then genes that are related to senescence start to increase in these um, adult uh, stem cells. So this one, the first study, you know, that shows, shows in uh, adipose-derived MSCs. And then aging can also affect the availability of certain type of stem cells that are important for their angiogenic potentials. So you're losing certain cell types. And then as we age, they've shown in bone marrow derived stem cells, there's increased level of reactive oxygen species. So, so these cells will start to accumulate higher levels of these reactive oxygen species. And not only they have higher levels, when these cells, because they're older, they're also more sensitive to, to the reactive oxygen species. And that further impairs their ability to, to be therapeutic, to, to be helpful. And when we looked at, um, uh, so in a 2010 study, they looked at young MSCs, which is from somebody age one to five years of age. They outperformed older MSCs, and that's from somebody 50 to 70 years of age, uh, when they looked at how well these cells are able to help people recover from um, uh, MI, right, after heart attack, to see how well their cardiac function can, can improve. So the young stem cells definitely outperform the older stem cells. And then MSCs from young individuals can also have a broader potential for differentiation, such as developing into neural, you know, neuroectodermal uh, type of uh, cells. So they can do that in vitro, but when you looked at bone marrow derived stem cells from elderly patients, they can't do that anymore. So they lost certain potentials. And also you have to realize that we have been exposed, you know, not to only toxins, but to, to drugs, right? We, we, have, we have a lifetime to accumulate different things. And something as benign as NSAIDs that so many take, people take, you know, liberally, and that may inhibit MSC's ability to differentiate into, into cartilage. Uh, also, it disrupts their ability to help bone, bone formation. Um, so, so these medications are, are, can damage our stem cells. And also lifestyles, something um, like our diet. So this study, 2013 study, looked at adipose-derived stem cells um, from um, mice that's been fed high-fat diet. And these mice, you know, these MSCs turned out to tend to form um, fat cells. So they tend to differentiate preferably to, to fat cells instead of endothelial cells. Um, so it changes how they differentiate. So these are lifestyle, you know, your diet. And even in obese patients. So they looked at um, how well uh, the stem cells in an obese patient are able to differentiate. And they realize, oh, um, they have less ability, uh, impaired ability to form new bones. So when they looked at um, the new bone formation, the mineralization nodules are fewer and they're smaller. Um, and metabolic diseases like diabetes also, also change the adipose-derived stem cells, uh, change their environment and diminish their ability to establish a uh, vascular network both in, in vivo and in vitro. So, and we know how prevalent obesity is and, and how, you know, a, a more than a third of the population is overweight and more than 8% with diabetes. So this is not an insignificant uh, issue, you know, when we age. And um, so mesen mesenchymal stem cell, they, they do age. And this is um, one article that talked about how aging can lead to decreased bone marrow MSC pool. So reduced number of MSCs and then a biased differentiation. So they pref you know, prefer the cells will tend to differentiate into adipocyte at, at the cost of osteoblast. So 
they, they have, you know, turn more into uh, go on the path to form fat rather than form new bones. And that is one underlying etiology for osteoporosis. So we all know as the bone marrow age, the, the bone marrow start to take on a different color. They look instead of red, they look more and more yellow. So it gets more and more fatty. And then when we transplant young MSCs into the bone marrow of aged mice, not only it can rescue bone loss, but it can also delay aging. So when you transplant, it, it, it helps their bone growth, uh, reduce bone loss, but delays their aging. And, and what's really fascinating is that even if you put these cells subcutaneously, it can still suppress age-related degeneration of various organs. So that's the, the, the systemic effect of, that of these cells, that they, they're able to, first of all, they can get into your bloodstream, um, but even local cells, they can secrete these factors that will get into your systemic circulation. So they can provide these anti-aging benefits. And um, so the aging of MSCs, not only is it detrimental to uh, to the skeletal system, but also to non-skeletal tissues, including the hematopoietic system. And aging, um, so aging does compromise the therapeutic potential of MSCs. Um, so these, the aging I'm talking about is not just from the cells from aging individual, but also cells that are cultured for many passages. And this is one reason that I'm, you know, I'm very careful about when people want to um, used um, uh, grow cells and culture for for many generations, and so they can a achieve huge number of cells, and 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 that can lead to cell aging, and besides all kinds of other issues. Um, so the transplantation of MSCs from young donors can actually delay aging in mice. Um, stem cells from older donors do have defective function. Uh, such as uh, impaired capacity to proliferate and differentiate when they compare to young young uh, cells, cells from young individuals. And when you looked at when you look at bone marrow derived stem cells isolated from either young or old mice, so young is one to two months old, old is twenty to twenty four months old. The bone marrow MSCs from older animals had significantly less capacity for differentiation into bone muscle, fat, or neurons also, any of these differentiations, so all their differentiation potentials have lowered. But when you transplant young uh, bone marrow derived stem cells, that can significantly delay the decrease of bone density. So it delays the, the osteoporotic parotic process. But you know what's scary is if you transplant old bone marrow derived stem cells, that can accelerate the decline of bone density. So you're actually causing some harm. And so what can stem cells do about aging? Um, what are some of the evidence? So I wanna show you a little bit. Um, so this is a study that, um, that I'm gonna talk for, you know, quite a few slides. Um, they're looking at um, the properties of um, either M human amniotic membrane derived or adipose derived stem cells, uh, you know, to look at how they can extend uh, lifespan in this, these rats, these fairly common rats. Um, so aging does lead to progressive deterioration of the cholinergic and dopaminergic system. The concentration of these neurotropins in both the brain and muscles decline, and that lead to uh, reduced neurogenesis an accelerated mus muscular atrophy, and that can impair, you know, both our cognitive function and our physical function. So aging can lead to exhaustion of our stem cell population, as we saw earlier on. And various stem cells can exert neuroprotective effects and enhance function re functional recovery by secreting these neurotropic factors. And there's concentration of these toxic substance like like the, the T-bar byproducts, lipid peroxidation, also significantly increase in the brain, muscle, heart, liver, lungs of aging rats, along with lowered blood vessel density. So that's what happens when we age. And when they transplanted um, adipose-derived MSCs uh, into this um, kind of Alzheimer model 
uh, model mice, they showed increased brain concentration of acetylcholine, BDNF, and NGF, and, and with improved cognitive and physical function of these aging mice. And adipose-derived MICs also can secrete a high concentration of VEGF, uh, vascular endocrine growth factor, and that can contribute to the pro prolongation of lifespan in an ALL ALS mouse, uh, mouse model. And even muscle-derived stem cells can help extend health span and lifespan of um, a, a progeria mice model by restoring these microvessels and muscle fibers by the, you know, these factors that they secrete. And in, in their experiment, they looked at aged mice. So 10 months old is aged mice. And they were divided into three groups with uh, control with uh, a group receiving amniotic membrane derived MICs, another group receiving adipose derived MICs. And they used young rats, seven, seven week old rats as control, healthy control. So they um, did intravenous uh, infusion through tail vein uh, of the amniotic and adipose derived MICs. And they were given to these rats once a month until they die. Um, so amniotic membrane and adipose derived MICs have been shown to significant to, to improve cognitive and physical function of these aging rats and extending their lifespan by you know 23 and 31 percent respectively. So th these two groups show slightly different, but they both extended lifespan. And by the time the rats reached 20 months of age, um, only 30 percent of the controls are still living but 70% um, of the amniotic membrane derived stem cell group and 100% of the adipose MSC derived group um, treated group actually are still alive. And by 23 months of age, all the rats in the control group have died, but in the treated group, the survival rate is 60 to 72%. Uh, so that's pretty remarkable. And the transplanted cells were also found to differentiate into neurons. And the differentiation rate is between uh, 54 to 76%. Um, so that's also very interesting that they, yeah, that is, you know, even though majority of their function is not to differentiate, but here we've seen, you know, quite a significant differentiation. And when they looked at these various brain uh, neurotropic factors, they've shown that they were all upregulated uh, in, the, in the treated group. And VEGF also um, that possessed the angiogenic potential was greatly increased to levels even higher than in younger rats. So the treated older rats have a higher level than the younger rats. And when you looked at the muscular neurotopic factors, um, they were also restored. And some of them um, were restored um, and uh, upregulated and and improve the the motor neuron development, muscular innervation, and um, to the level higher than in younger rats. Um, and the transplantation of both groups actually significantly improved the number of vessels comparing to you know comparable to to the younger rats. So basically, you are kind of bringing them back into the younger state. And tissue injury was nearly fully attenuated by the transplantation of these MSCs. And the monthly transplantation of the MSCs markedly increased the stamina and the cognitive function of these old rats. The acetylcholine concentration in CSF and muscles were um, also restored. So, you know, they were declined significantly as they've aged but they were also restored. And um, the alteration in, it, in the gene expression of the cholinergic nerve markers um, associated with, um, with aging were also restored. So um, one mechanism I, I didn't even talk about that in how MSCs work, um, one is that when they secrete exosomes, um, within the, containing the exosomes are microRNAs, and, and these microRNAs can cross the 
the cell membrane and nu uh, the nucleus, the nuclear membrane, and actually interact with the DNA and help repair some of the DNA d damages and change methylation patterns. So that's things happening on the genetic level. And the number of host stem cells in these aged rats, even though they were very low, right, um, you know, less than 30% that of young rats, the transplantation actually increased the number to the level that's comparable to the young rats. Um, and then the expression of certain chem chemokines that, that suppress neurogenesis that's associated with aging um, and also markers associated with uh, neural uh, skeletal proteins, these were also reversed. So these, um, you know, Unfortunate changes that associated with aging were, were reversed after we gave the, you know, the, 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 the rats received stem cells. So, so basically, in short, um, the transplant, stem cell transplantation increased the concentration of acetylcholine and various neurotropic factors, and that restored the cholinergic and dopaminergic nervous systems, improved microvessels and muscle mass, and then and antioxidative capacities. So here's a, a different study um, that's also very interesting. Um, they were looking at bone marrow um, transplantation from young mice to old mice. Um, they were using mice that are pretty old, 15 months old, which is equivalent to human age of 75 years, where 50% of their peers have died. Um, at this point, they were giving intravenous bone marrow-derived MSCs to these mice. And the dose were um, 100 million of these uh, nucleated cells, not just uh, MSCs, but there's some MSCs in there. Um, small percentage, but the nucleated cells are also, uh, you know, incredibly helpful. So the, they were injecting them through, again, intravenously, and they repeated it six times within three months. And they used mice that were very young, aged three to 15 months as the donor. The results is that the maximum lifespan in the transplanted mice were increased by over 30%. And the survival time from the beginning of the experiment to, to, to the time, you know, where, where of course survival time starting from the beginning, um, the it increased by 3.2 uh, fold, which means that um, the rats that got the stem cell transplantation you know, from the time of the start of the experiment, uh, had three times as long to live as the um, the, the, the control group. And at age 19.3 months, the last mouse of the control group actually looked kind of sad. They died sedentary, almost immobile, and with a hunched back and poor hair. But the group that had received the transplant actually were active, they had even spine, and shiny, and even hair. Um, the observed lifespan extension was accompanied by extension of the health span, so they're more active and they, they're healthier. And there's also chimerism, so the integration of the DNA um, is six months after transplantation, that, that was about 28%. So that's a very encouraging result, you know, looking at our aging population, right? Um, so this is another study looking at uh, humans and what stem cell transplantation can do for uh, chronic inflammation and aging. So all these patients had, um, you know, some kind of inflammatory condition, uh, such as osteoarthritis, post-traumatic arthritis, inflammatory back pain, um, shoulder, you know, bursitis or herniated disc. And um, they give one time IV infusion of 25 million umbilical cord blood derived stem cells. And um, there's no side effect noted. And 10 patients show significant improvement in the lab tests and uh, anti-aging benefits. Um, so so the, uh, uh, the inflammatory markers in three months do not show change, but they have shown improvements. Uh, half the patients showed improvements in these basic labs. Um, and then when they looked at different um, parameters like skin, hair, nail growth, energy levels, libido, mood, sleep, and pain level, those have all been uh, improved and significantly. And, I, you know, lastly, I want to talk just a little bit about frailty. You know, as people get older, um, people get frail, and that can be 
manifested by, you know, decline in limb body mass, strength, endurance, balance, gait, speed, activity level, energy level, and also organ reserve. Um, so the frail, frailty is, is a big issue, increase the risk of falls, hospitalization, institutionalization, disability, and death. Um, you can measure frailty using this uh, CHS index. So there, there are five criteria, weak grip strength, low energy level, uh, self-reported exhaustion, slow gait speed, low physical level, and or uh, unintentional weight loss. So the prevalence of frailty which means you meet, you know, at least three out of the five criteria. So the population uh, with frailty in in the in in our age over sixty five group is seven to twelve percent. So so approximately about ten percent of these, um, you know, people over age fifty five are do have frailty. But there's also pre frailty where they meet one to two criteria out of the five. And that prevalence in the same population is about 35 to 50%. So that is a huge population. And the comorbidities are actually um, much, are much more prevalent in the pre frail population compared to the non pre non-frail uh, population. So there's various declines in, you know, cardiovascular, pulmonary, musculoskeletal, neuro, uh, neurologic, and psychiatric conditions. So there's significant decline, um, you know, even if you just pre-frail. And there's strong link between frailty, inflammation, and impaired ability to repair tissue because of decrease in, in the stem cell population and stem cell activity. And, um, uh, so we all know our own stem cell population and function decline with age and aging can actually induce what's called quiescence to senescence switch. So these cells, you know, they, instead of just being quiescent, they become senescent. So they actually uh, degrade and that can also cause degradation, um, a degra degradation in the extracellular matrix and, and impair the niche that they're in. And that can reduce the stem cell ability to renew themselves, to, to maintain their, their vitality and their regenerative potentials. Um, so then these have been linked to the frailty syndrome. And MSCs also undergo senescence. And so we talked about that, you know, various properties impaired. Um, and then when they deliver allergenic MSCs, uh, they've shown that not only they're safe, but they can produce significant improvement in the physical performance and measures and inflammatory biomarkers. So there's significant improvement. Um, so what I want to talk about next is that, okay, that, that all sounds great. So what does that mean for my practice? What can I do? Um, so I want to talk about the protocol a little bit. And before I talk about protocol, I, I want to mention, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to do an anti-aging regimen using a person's own stem cells. First of all, the moment you take your stem cells out, um, you have just decreased your own stem cell supply. So you can take them out and use it for you know particular condition. It can help, but you have reduced your own stem cell supply. So that's no question. But also when you go through a surgical procedure, um, when you either drill into somebody's bone or you do a liposuction, you get the fat out, you just created an injury, you know, not a small injury. So you, you created an injury. And when these cells are put in the body, uh, guess what the cells are attracted to? They're attracted to inflammation and injury. That's, that's how they work. That's why they're there. They are sensing what's going on, what kind of signals are sent through the blood, and then they will respond to that signal by getting into your blood vessels and swim upstream, finding those signals and getting out of the bloodstream and, and exert local effect. So you can imagine if you just produce the injury and you give somebody these stem cells, some of those stem cells are going to go right into the areas that are, are screaming, help me, right, to, to start the repair process. So that, that's something you need to think about. But also these cells from our own body, uh, like I mentioned, it has aged. And there's no way around it. It has been with us for all these years. It has aged with us. So it's not as good. Not only is it not as good there's also more of a potential to do harm. And, you know, we've seen that, um, you know, in, in infusing older MSCs can also can potentially lead to dis 
you know, acceleration of the bone decline. But um, we have also shown, we have seen evidence that um, our own MSCs, for example, adipose derived MSCs, when they put it next to cancer cells, they, they, in, in that instance, they used um, a glioblastoma multiforme uh, cancer cells. They, from both in vivo and in vitro experimentation, the adipose derived MSCs caused the cancer to grow to flourish, but the umbilical cord MSCs actually, you know, make them reduce in number and size and getting rid of them. So there's huge difference. Um, and also it's impossible to do an anti-aging protocol using a person's own, you know, cells. Not only you are um, doing a liposuction or, um, you know, bone drilling uh, periodically, but also, um, you know, you, you know, you just can't sustain that on a regular basis if you're trying to do anti-aging practice. And, uh, and if you want to extend or expand the cell population to a huge number, the problem is that the more you expand, the less potent the cells are. When you expand cells uh, upon certain populations, about four generations, they're going to start to decline. And, and even, even before that, a lot of times, if it's not the perfect condition, they will not go, you know, one stem cells are not going to divide into two identical stem cells. They often divide into one stem cell and one daughter cell. So it's very difficult to control. And so you end up with a big population, but a lot of them are not the original stem cells anymore. Um, so, so these are some of the reasons. This is why I'm a, a big proponent of, um, birth tissue derived stem cells and mostly umbilical cord stem cells because these are so young, so potent, and they're also safer as far as um, preventing the, you know, triggering the growth of cancer. Um, so various reasons, but also of course they're very convenient and you can do it on a regular basis. Um, I have been doing stem cells on myself. Um, I, I do IV infusions on myself. It's been five years. I've been doing it um, every three months. So that's my protocol. But I, I'll show you the, the, the protocol and how to calculate the dosage. So what you want to do is minimally manipulated birth tissue derived MSCs. Um, so those are the benchmarks. These are the master regeneration. Not that other cells are not helpful, but you need the MSCs. Um, so with these MSCs, you know, I, I do not, um, you know, in the U.S., you, you, unless you have a, you know, you're under IND, um, you can't manipulate the cells, which include using enzyme to obtain the cells or altering the cells with any kind of chemicals or expanding, you know, growing them in large numbers. But you can use min minimally manipulated cells and, and they are considered um, tissue transplant. So that's what I would advise providers to use. And the MSC dose would be 2 million MSCs for every 60 pounds of body weight. Um, these are non-expanded, right? Unexpanded stem cells. Most of the studies, when people look at high numbers, those are expanded cells. So a lot of dosage are really high. Um, they will give you some recommendation. The range has been between 0.2 to one or even 2 million cells per kilo. Um, so that's a huge number, huge um, number of cells. But um, if you're using minimally manipulated cells, the cells are going to make more of themselves in the body, right? Um, I think the human body is the most ideal incubator, will be way more sophisticated than the incubator that's sitting in the lab. And, and also our body will give the cells certain signals. So the cells will respond to what's needed to and a direction of, of how they should um, differentiate and how they should, what kind of exosomes they should secrete. So it's a targeted response. And um, so when I calculate the dosage, 2 million cells, so 2 million cells, you know, I, I'm talking about 1 cc, you know, 1 cc has 2 million cells. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the product that actually has that high of a dosage. So you add another 2 million for if somebody has age over 65 to 70, and you add another 2 million for somebody that has a really severe or aggressive disease condition. So that's a pretty simple um, a, uh, a dosing kind of regimen. And the, the, as far as the treatment, um, how you should do it, how frequent, 
Um, if somebody comes to me initially with any kind of health issue, I will give them, you know, treat them at the recommended dosage. Um, the average dose will be between, you know, 2 million to 8 million, right? So, you know, uh, two to four cc's of, of uh, eight two million per cc product. Um, so once I give them the treatment, then I want to see how they do. I'm not a very dogmatic person. I don't say you have to do how many numbers within how long because I've seen people who recover incredibly with just one treatment, and there are people who who need a series of few. So I'll tell them let's wait you know, for four to six weeks, depending on what you're treating, you know, neurological conditions sometimes takes longer because it takes so long to observe any, any effect, any changes. Um, but on, on average, you know, between four to six weeks, we can do a booster. If you need another booster, we can do that as well. So that's the initial treatment phase, right? Get a person to a really good state. And then you enter the maintenance phase. And that's, um, you know, in general, I tell people, yes, you know, probably once every six months, because the cells usually stay in the human body for about three months, and then their effect will last for about another three months because they do secrete these factors and they do have downstream effects. And also the, the mRNAs from the exosomes will get into cell nucleus that can pr produce you know, longer term benefits. Um, the intervals can range between three to 12 months. And I have patients who want to do you know, every two months or, or even every month, but it, but it does get, get very costly. Um, so most of my patients are doing you know, between three, you know, between three to, to 12 months. You know, most of them you know, between three to six months. So that will be a good anti aging regimen. So we have a lot longer lifespan compared to mice and the mice we're getting once a month. So we don't need to uh, get as frequently. Um, I believe every three to six months is a really, really good interval. And of course, the patient can always, you know, be, be very, uh, be more aggressive about their own anti-aging regimen. And so I think through these powerful, powerful methods, we can really help our patients to live more years and with more vitality, you know, in these remaining years, um, because there's, you know, years don't mean anything if it's not healthy and it's not, you know, enjoyable. So that's the end of my talk. If you want to reach reach me, um, that's my email, joykongmd at gmail.com. So I don't know if there's any questions, but that's the end of my talk. Okay, so I don't see any questions yet. Um, then, you know, if you have any questions, that's, there's my email, feel free to contact me. I, um, you know, one of my missions is to help doctors to really um, have a good understanding of stem cell therapy and not only of just the general idea, but also exact protocol, how to do this, and also what kind of evidence is out there. So there's actually a um, online training course, it's called Fundamentals of Stem Cell Practice on American, on the uh, Academy website. So it's just aaict.org. So if you want to go on aaict.org, you know, under training, there's that training course. And, um, and, and you can, you know, receive a certificate at the end of the training. It's extremely helpful, it's very practice oriented. So, um, so I hope I see more of you there.